So first of all, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon and evening if uh, you're on the East Coast. Um, my name is Tanner Dagdalen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Unite, and it is my uh, pleasure and honor to be hosting uh, Dr. Hande Erzdenler uh, for uh, today's talk. Her topic today is going to be focused on targeting the brain for ALS therapies. We're super excited to have this conversation and, and hear her presentation. Uh, there'll be a time at the end for any questions that you have, so feel free to ask any questions in the chat during the presentation, and we'll uh, address them at the end. Uh, we'll reserve the last 15 minutes for questions, and I'll also be asking some questions. Um, before we get started here, just a little bit of background on Unite. Uh, we're a health technology company committed to accelerating ALS research by uniting people living with ALS, caregivers, data, and researchers all in the same place. And recently we launched a ALS clinical trial concierge program for anyone who's interested in pursuing uh, getting access to an experimental therapy in a, a clinical trial, uh, whether you're having trouble or not, whether you think you may be qualified uh, for a trial in your area or not. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at our website go and, and call the number or schedule an appointment with us uh, or send us an email and we can help you get uh, access to a clinical trial in your area. So with that, uh, I'll come back to the, the trial concierge program at the end again, but uh, it's an absolute honor uh, to serve this community and it's uh, an even bigger honor to be uh, in the presence of such an amazing researcher, Dr. Erzdenler, uh, and excited to hear today's talk. So she'll be uh, presenting for the, the first 40 to 45 minutes about the, the groundbreaking research that looks at the brain motor neurons as a target for developing ALS therapies. And after that, the two of us will have a follow-up discussion and answer as many of your questions as possible. Uh, if you have a question at any time during the event, uh, please use the Q&A feature to submit your question. You can also submit them uh, in the chat uh, if you wish, and we'll answer them during the, the follow-up discussion. So now, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Hande Erzdenler is an associate professor at the Department of Neurology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine uh, and affiliated faculty member uh, to the Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer Research Center, the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Research Center, and the Neurobiology Program at the Ann and Robert L. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Dr. Erzdenler, leads the ALS research lab at Northwestern, where they are interested in understanding the cellular and molecular mechanisms responsible for early vulnerability and progressive degeneration of upper motor neurons. Dr. Erzdenler became the first person to label, isolate, and culture the corticospinal motor neurons in an effort to understand their requirements for survival. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Erzdenler. If you're ready, please yes. begin your presentation. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the great introduction. I'm very happy to join uh, your um, webinar uh, series, and I know you have uh, hosted excellent uh, programs before, and I have learned tremendously from the webinars that you organize. So I, I'm very honored to be uh, one of your presenters tonight. And as you said, we will be talking about the brain component of ALS and why this may be important for uh, developing effective and uh, long-term treatment strategies. So before I start, I just want to thank everyone in, in, in our lab uh, for their contribution, for their uh, tireless efforts. And we are an ever-growing lab. And if you're interested in upper motor neurons, in motor neuron biology, please get in touch with us. We would like, love to work with uh, enthusiastic young scientists. And I'm very thankful um, to people in the lab. And I think I'm going to talk mainly about uh, Barish Genç, Mukesh Gautam, and Chris, um, um, presentations uh, or their, their work mostly today. And I'm also very thankful for many of the foundations who supported us and we receive grants from NIH, NIA, and I'm the scientific director of A Long Swim now. Of course, we received uh, grants from Spastic Paraplegia Foundation, Les Turner ALS Foundation, ALS Association, Brain Research Foundation, and I am um, very thankful uh, for, for their support and for the philanthropy, um, and this has been um, 
a great uh, support for our lab and it enabled us to do some of the research that we couldn't do otherwise. So today I will talk to you about the um, treatment strategies for ALS, um, focusing, our, um, focusing our efforts on upper motor neurons. But there has been um, uh, a, a void of understanding maybe for the importance of upper motor neurons in ALS. So for many years, uh, people have thought that um, the brain component is not so important in ALS and that the upper motor neurons are going to degenerate anyways. And their degeneration is a consequence of what's happening in the spinal motor neuron, or it is secondary to what's happening in the um, periphery. So then there is actually one way street of neurodegeneration that starts from the neuromuscular junction to the spinal motor neurons, to the corticospinal tract, and finally the cortex. So then the cortex has never been the attention for any therapeutic strategy because they said, you know, they're going to die anyways. Why bother? And brain is so complex. And, you know, um, brain had, had been uh, a no-touch zone or, you know, stay away zone for many years. And our thinking was actually just the opposite because we knew that the movement starts in the brain and the brain is important, but then uh, how important and also how can we bring effective treatment strategies uh, to ALS by focusing our attention to the brain? So those were very tough questions uh, to answer. But as I said, because the movement starts in the brain, especially the voluntary movement, which requires cognitive uh, input, let's say opening the door, um, you know, grabbing a glass, dancing, um, you know, let's say moving the key inside and typing, speaking even. Um, so all these movements um, require the cortex to collect all the information from uh, many regions of the cerebral cortex and integrate them and transmit them to the spinal cord targets where the spinal motor neurons are activated, right? And in turn, these spinal motor neurons are the ones which reach the muscle, right? And then they execute a uh, movement. So in that case, the spinal motor neurons uh, execute function, but the upper motor neurons um, are the ones actually uh, which carry the information from the brain to the spinal cord. So there is this circuitry and in this very, very simplistic form that the brain is important because it initiates the movement, modulates the movement, but it's actually the spinal motor neurons who does the work. So we cannot say that spinal motor neurons are important, upper motor neurons are not, or upper motor neurons are important and spinal motor neurons are not. They are both important. So it is the circuitry that degenerates in ALS patients and if we want to develop a long-term and effective treatment strategy, we have to include brain and spinal cord together in the same equation. So that's our starting point, so that you know, we should not leave the brain out. And, but what is the um, finding that suggests that the brain is important? We know now that this uh, brain actually raises the red flag very early in the disease. There is uh, cortical hyperexcitation, which occurs even like six months prior to symptom onset in many of the ALS patients, so that this uh, pathophysiological um, um, state of the cortex uh, or the cortical dysfunction is a very early event. And then, uh, you know, our colleagues like Steve Wookie and Matthew Kiernan uh, have already shown that the cortical dysfunction and cortical hyperexcitability can even be considered a, as a, a diagnostic marker for uh, ALS because it occurs uh, very early in the disease. And many other uh, scientists like Caroline uh, Rooks and um, have shown that the cortex uh, raises the red flag and cortical degeneration is an early event. And there are technical ways to detect this. One of them is the TMS recording and that uh, with the magnetic field stimulation and you know, uh, reading from it's basically from the thumb region, you can uh, see the um, cortical uh, function or dysfunction uh, very early in the disease. And there's, there seems to be 
an uh, imbalance between excitation and inhibition, and uh, that there is early spine loss in the corticospinal motor neurons or the upper motor neurons, and that there is some excitation and inhibition uh, dysregulation. And again, you know, many in the field also suggest that cortical hyperexcitability can be a, use, a diagnostic biomarker, which again tells us the cortex is involved very early. And then there's this hypothesis, you know, is it dying back? Is it dying forward? Is it going towards the brain? Is it brain initiated going towards the, um, um, you know, periphery? I think it's more complex than this. I don't think it's just one way street, one way or the other. It is like the London Bridge is falling down, right? The whole thing is falling down. And the, the thing that, uh, the, the reason that we call these upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons, it's as if like, they are the same neuron and one is in the uh, one is one lives in a uh, higher altitude is may not be true that these neurons may indeed be two very different neuron populations we just call them similar names but they are born differently they migrate differently they mature differently they express different trans transcription factors their survival requirements are different so these are very very different neuron populations it's our expectation that these are the same, you know, motor neurons, one in the brain, one in the spinal cord, but actually they may be very different. And I don't think that there's just one explanation that it goes from cortex to spinal cord or spinal cord to cortex. And also in patients, it's very heterogeneous, right? Some patients uh, display uh, pre predominant upper motor neuron loss, and some patients do not show that much uh, upper motor neuron loss. So it's a different extent. The timing is very different progression is very different. So I don't think there's just uh, one definition that fits for everyone. But my point is that let's not leave the brain out. Let's not assume that the brain does not matter. But I don't want to push for the idea that it's all, it's, it's the brain that matters the most. But I just want to say that brain also matters, okay? So uh, why brain matters? Because the uh, the upper motor neurons are the ones actually who communicate with many different neuron types in the brain. Let's say thalamocortical neurons, colossal projection neurons, interneurons, and everything, and they integrate the information, even from project long distance projection neurons or local circuitry neurons, and they um, put these in put these uh, different informations together, translate them, and then send it to spinal cord targets. So then the apical dendrite, it's actually here. The, so let's say this is the cell body and you can see the apical dendrite here extending to the pia is extremely important for cortical connectivity because this is the site where other neurons communicate with the upper motor neurons, okay? So if the apical dendrite you can see is broken apart or falling apart or filled with vacuoles and no spines, how can they speak to each other? So when the apical dendrite de de uh, degenerates and it, when it is filled with vacuoles and no spine, then they are left out of the equation and they are left, you know, they, nobody can speak to them. If nobody can speak to them, how are they going to collect all the information and send it to the spinal cord targets? It would be very hard. And that's exactly what we see. We see that early in the disease, the upper, the upper motor neurons, especially the apical dendrites, begin to degenerate very early. There's spine loss very early. And that tells us that the cortex begin to fail to connect the cortex and the spinal cord and carry the information from the cortex to the spinal cord. So if the spinal cord cannot get proper input from the cortex, um, their activity may also be uh, affected. And of course, we show that there's electrophysiological determinants of these vulnerability, that this uh, excitatory uh, inputs and inhibitor uh, in inputs are affected very early in the disease. So then, all right, brain is important, right? So this paper from uh, Clive Svensson actually was the first to show that if you correct the, uh, super, the SOD1 mutation only in the motor cortex, of SOD1 G93A rat model, they were able to show that this not only improves the lifespan of the rat model, but also improves the 
health of spinal motor neurons and the neuromuscular junction. Can you imagine? So when they removed this um, mutation from the motor cortex only by uh, using uh, AAV uh, mediated gene delivery silencing, then they were able to uh, improve the health of the spiral motor neurons and the neuromuscular junction. So this was actually one of the first studies to show that the cortex may actually be a target, right? So improving the health of the cortex will have consequences to the whole motor neuron circuitry. That was very important. And of course, more work has uh, come to show uh, that the cerebral projection neurons, uh, especially in uh, mouse models, uh, have an impact on disease so that when you actually correct the cortex, the whole motor neuron circuitry will be uh, will benefit from this. And Dr. Brown actually wrote a very nice review about that and a, a commentary about this. So then this cortical influence drives ALS, right? The cortex has an impact on the ALS pathology, Begin, started to gain more attention as more independent labs begin to uh, reach to the same conclusion. So then the, the idea of uh, let's improve the health of the brain, and that would have an overall impact to the whole motor neuron circuitry, gained more attention. And of course, there were uh, more work um, showing that the uh, cortical uh, disease was an early event, and that improving the health of the cortex will have positive uh, impact on ALS patients. So that was very good. Then, um, you know, recent evidence begin to show that the brain is actually more important than people thought. That the brain uh, raises the red flag early so that the cortical degeneration is not, as it, is not a late event, it is an early event. And that if you improve the brain health or the upper motor neuron health, the, brain com the health of the brain component, this may have implications for the whole motor neuron circuitry. Especially this is very true for uh, humans, right? Because they have direct, mostly direct connection from the cord, uh, upper motor neurons to the spinal motor neurons. But then how can the brain be a therapeutic target? Brain is heterogeneous. There are so many neuron populations. I mean, how are we going to develop brain as a therapeutic target? And how can we build effective treatment strategies? So those are the main questions that we need to answer. But at least we understood that the brain is important. So that was a major accomplishment, I would say. So we recently published a paper in Nature Gene Therapy about how we think that the motor neurons are indeed a target for gene therapy. And then we identified a novel gene uh, that would help uh, improve the health of the uh, upper motor neurons that are diseased due to uh, misfolded SOD1 toxicity and TDP pathology. So I'm going to uh, discuss this a little bit. And before I do that, I want to thank Dr. Clive Svensson for writing a very nice commentary about our uh, paper, um, again, uh, emphasizing the importance of um, um, the upper motor neurons for developing therapies in ALS. Remember I told you uh, about this two hypotheses, die back, die forward, like is it, are the upper motor neurons dying because spinal motor neurons are dying or spinal motor neurons dying because upper motor neurons are dying? Like, you know, which is it egg or the chicken, chicken or the egg, which dies first? Is it this way? Is it this way? You know, that was a major question. So how do we address this and how do we bring a resolution to this, right? So then we said, okay, why don't we uh, use uh, these, um, uh, reporter, reporters, for example, RB4 and HB9, Cree models, where you can actually delete uh, gene expression either in the cortex or in the spinal cord. Okay, so you can um, uh, separate cortex from the spinal cord so that, for example, whatever is disease causing, you can make that disease causing thing only in the brain while spinal motor neurons are healthy, or you can make that disease causing thing only in the spinal cord, leaving the brain healthy. So if the hypothesis is correct, that the, when the spinal motor neurons are diseased, right, they will eventually make the brain uh, sick, right? So then it's going to go from spinal cord to the cortex. Or alternatively, if the brain is diseased, 
and the spinal cord are healthy, it's going to make the brain disease in the brain will eventually make spinal cord uh, disease, right? So it's very complicated, but basically you separate brain and uh, spinal cord. One is healthy, one is diseased. And then you look at the health of the neuron. Because if the upper motor neuron disease is due to spinal motor neuron degeneration, and it's a byproduct of the spinal motor neuron degeneration, when the spinal motor neurons are diseased and cortex, let's say, doesn't have the disease causing thing, it should eventually get diseased, right? So this is very complex, but let me explain very simply that we found a um, couple of years ago that in the UCHL1 null mice, the corticospinal motor neurons, the upper motor neurons degenerate very robustly, and I'm going to get to that. And so we took out this uh, corticospinal, the UCHL1, only from the cortex. You can see that the cortical cells are, uh, de de they, are they don't have this um, mutated UCHL1, right? And then if you look at the spinal cord, they have, and then we also made the spinal motor neurons with the HB9 CRE so that we can parse out either in the cortex or in the spinal cord, okay? So we made two different reporter lines. And look at this, you can definitely get total ablation, which means they don't express that anymore, okay? So this is very good. So we get very clear deletion from the spinal cord while they express it in the cortex. And we get the same way, total ablation from the cortex while they express it in the spinal cord, okay? So then we say, all right, if that's the case, tell me if upper motor neurons are healthy or not. So in the UCHL1 null mice, which means they don't have UCHL1 in the cortex and in the spinal cord, like this is severe disease case. And yes, apical dendrites are filled with vacuole. They are very thin. They don't have spines. Then we said, okay, how about I knock out this um, only in the, um, let's say, spinal cord? How is the cortex? Well, cortex is fine. So you knock out in the spinal cord, you know, you, the, the, uh, the cortex is not affected. Then it's all right, how about, how if I keep it in the cortex and the spinal cord is healthy? Mm, so the, the brain neurons are still diseased. So it doesn't matter if the spinal motor neurons are healthy or not. You know, if you make the brain diseased, it's, it is diseased. So this study actually begin to reveal that uh, the brain degeneration is not a consequence of the spinal motor neuron degeneration. So the spinal motor neurons, they may be healthy, they may be diseased, but that does not reflect onto the upper motor neurons. So then we have to think them separately as different entities. And I think that was very important because this die back, die forward thing um, was not so relevant because these were two different motor neuron populations and they are diseased in ALS patients. And it is our expectation that if one disease, the other one is diseased or one disease is a result, the, the, the death of the other one, it may not be. They may be two independent neuron populations. And in an effort to bring effective treatment strategies for ALS, we have to cure them both because they are, uh, the, the components, the important components of the circuitry that degenerates in ALS patients. Like you can't have a bridge by just repairing one arm of the bridge or one leg of the bridge. If you want to build uh, bridges, you need to repair both legs or both parts, right? And I showed you the apical dendrites, they were degenerating. And then people sometimes say, oh, this is the mouse model. You only see it in the mouse. You don't see it in the patient. And this is, you know, that, that's not shown in the patient. And then we actually looked in the patients. These were uh, post-mortem um, samples. And we looked at the apical dendrites of sporadic ALS, familial ALS, FTD ALS, and look at this. Their apical dendrites were filled with vacuoles. They were de degenerating. But if you look at the healthy controls, you can see beautiful apical dendrites. You can even see spines. And 
familiar case cases, look at this, they're almost like ghosts. So if you have an apical dendrite like this, it's impossible for the brain to uh, integrate and to send information uh, via the uh, upper motor neurons. And we realized that a very high population or percentage of uh, bed cells or upper motor neurons in patients have this pathology. And um, this was an eye-opening because uh, the, the apical dendrites and the uh, upper motor neurons actually show degeneration very early because to show this extensive degeneration, uh, it must start early. It, it can't happen like overnight. So it is an ongoing degeneration. And uh, we think that brain um, component is, uh, uh, or degeneration of the brain component begins very early. And we find, for example, in the healthy apical dendrites, you have all these spines. And spines are very important because those are the sites where neurons shake hands. And neurons actually speak to each other by shaking hands, like they don't use words, right? So they communicate by shaking hands. And that shake, handshaking happens at the site of the uh, spine. So the more spines you have, th this means the more communication you have, the more connections you have. But if your apical dendrite is filled with vacuoles like this and you have one or two spine, like who's gonna talk to you? How are you going to have a conversation? It's very hard for neurons to keep their integrity. And to be, in a, to be functional, it's very important for neurons to communicate with each other, to shake hands with each other, right? So that's why um, we realized that regardless of the genotype or how we treat them, if uh, the apical dendrites are uh, diseased, they lose spines, or uh, this is the morphology of a diseased apical dendrites. And our goal is to bring them from this state to this state. And when they become healthy, and uh, we think that there will be a more functional connectivity, and we are testing this in our lab now. All right, so now we think that upper motor neuron degeneration is not a byproduct of spinal motor neuron degeneration, okay? So we really have to inc incorporate upper motor neurons to our thinking. And let me tell you this, there are so many clinical trials in ALS, many compounds in clinical trials. And believe me, when I tell you, none of those compounds have ever been tested for their ability to improve the health of upper motor neurons. Can you imagine? So they go to clinical trials, but they have never been tested to see if they improve the health of the upper motor neurons. That's how we ignored the brain for so long. I don't think we have the luxury to do this anymore. Like we really have to think, how can we make the upper motor neurons happy? Given the fact that they are extremely important for the initiation and modulation of movement. Okay then, so how do we target them, right? So I talked to you about this, um, the first paper that uh, I showed you this paper like targeted um, uh, with gene, gene therapy. And I, and I would tell you that uh, in our lab, we really think that gene therapy approaches would be very valuable, especially for rare disease patients, especially for patients uh, who have a known mutation or uh, whom we know um, the underlying cause of the disease or you know, the mechanism that are altered and so forth. So initially, uh, we developed this uh, AAV-mediated retrograde transduction to the upper motor neurons just to see, this was a very initial study, just to see if we can actually label and transduce upper motor neurons. So of course, in the mouse, the corticospinal tract is in the dorsal funiculus. It's much easier to target. In the human, it's a little bit harder, but this was a proof of concept experiment and it allowed us to see which serotypes um, uh, is good for retrograde transduction. Can we label these cells? Can we, isolate, can we uh, visualize them and so forth? And we realized AV2 was the serotype that allows us uh, to do the retrograde transduction most efficiently. And um, this retrograde transduction also enabled us to have a full vision, like full uh, 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 visual representation of the upper motor neurons in the motor cortex. And that was actually one of the studies that showed us how apical dendrites are degraded. This was the first time we realized and that was in the SOD1 model. Then we tried in the ALSA model, in the profilin model, in the TDP model. In every model that we have looked, we have seen apical dendrite degeneration. Then we looked in the human and we saw the same thing again. 
So that's why we think that this apical dendrite degeneration is a very important uh, problem the upper motor neurons are faced with. Uh, but again, this corticospinal tract injection may not be very feasible for uh, patients because the corticospinal tract is not mostly in the dorsal funiculus in the patient and uh, injections to the spinal cord, especially to the corticospinal tract in the ventral horn is very challenging. That's not very easy. Best would be direct cortex injection. So injecting from the cortex and you know those surgeries uh, are much easier than spinal cord uh, surgeries. And plus, you know, they are less complicated than deep brain stimulation or, you know, deep brain injections that the uh, Parkinson's disease patients uh, go through. So uh, technically or, you know, surgically, it is an easier procedure uh, than spinal cord injection. But then how is that possible? Because uh, the specificity is an issue then. In the cortex, it's very heterogeneous, but then how are we going to get just the upper motor neurons transduce? That's a, that's a tough question. That's why, again, we tried many different serotypes, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, like we tried them all. And then again, we realized AAV2, one more time, uh, it showed very um, uh, reduced levels of transduction. So you don't transduce a whole bunch of cells, okay? You transduce a small percentage of cells. But the good news is that small percentage is mostly the upper motor neuron. So there is more selectivity to it, okay? which is what we want, because you don't want to transduce all cells, all neurons, because when it is time to bring therapies, there may be side effects. And then rather than fixing something, now you can introduce some problems. So we rather say we want to uh, bring selective transduction only to the upper motor neurons that uh, show a primary or early vulnerability. And of course, there are many things that play a role in this. It's the uh, selection of promoters, selection of the capsid protein. Sometimes having a few mutations in the capsid protein enhances the transduction efficiency. So we tried, you know, mut mutations, CBA promoter, CMV promoter, this promoter, that promoter, this, this experiment. I mean, this paper, it took like four, four years for us to experiment. And then Finally, we came uh, to the conclusion that the mutations that we used in the capsid were not very effective, but the, uh, but the choice of the CBA promoter, it gave us about 70% of transduction efficiency of corticospinal motor neurons. This is huge. You know why? Because if there was no selectivity, okay, um, the percent distribution of upper motor neurons are less than 1%, okay? But now, you eat the virus, you transduce cells, and among all the cells that are transduced, 70% are CSMN. So going from 1% to 70%. So that's a huge en uh, enrichment. We are even uh, working with different promoters, different things, and I think we are coming to a, even a higher percentage now. So this selective transduction uh, issue is important, and we're tackling this um, in our lab. I'm gonna pass this. The beauty is that we were also able to see the corticospinal tract axons in the same mouse, so we can look at the upper motor neuron degeneration and the axonal degeneration, and it seems as if the apical dendrite degeneration actually uh, begins to occur a bit earlier than the uh, axonal degeneration. So we received actually a, a grant by Spastic Paraplegia Foundation working with Dr. Nicolas Hatsupoulos because we want to bring the studies that we have done in the mouse and in disease models in the mouse to macaque monkeys. Because we want to know if we can actually transduce the upper motor neurons in the macaque monkeys in, the, uh, in a cell type specific manner. So I'm very happy with this collaboration and I'm very thankful to the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation and we directly inject to the motor cortex in the macaque monkey and look at this. We actually get transduction, not all neurons in the brain. It's basically these large cells in the motor cortex. So we have actually performed these surgeries to three monkeys now. You can see these large bed cells when compared to the others, and they are the ones that are transduced. So these are very promising studies, and we would like to continue those because I think as we move forward, it would be very nice that we can transduce very selectively just the upper motor neurons in patients and uh, without uh, causing trouble uh, in other circuitries or either cells or neurons. So coming back to this paper, again, 
we, we think the upper motor neurons are a target for gene therapy. We think they are important. Now we're working with all these viruses and so forth. And what, which gene are we gonna give? Like, what, what is the target? What are we going to give? Okay, I have a couple more minutes. So it all started actually with this figure. And I took this photograph when I was a postdoc in Jeff Macklis's lab at Neurosurgery Department of Harvard Medical School. And I realized at the time that this protein, UCHL1, was expressed at high levels in the upper motor neurons. And I searched maybe more than 600 genes, you know, looking for genes that are expressed in the upper motor neurons throughout life. And, you know, it was, it was very many long sleepless nights. And I, and I realized at the time that these are retrogradely labeled upper motor neurons. They express very high levels of UCHL1. And what is UCHL1? It is actually a, a DUB. It aids a ubiquitin, it removes a ubiquitin. It's very important. It's very important for maintaining the uh, protein degradation because uh, protein degradation is usually mediated by the ubiquitin system. The ubiquitinated proteins are, are degraded. But ubiquitin is also important for uh, protein transport. They, the cell labels the proteins with different um, ways of um, ubiquitin. They, there's branching, there's K, there's, you know, there are many ways of adding the ubiquitin. And it tells the cell, oh, okay, you know what? This needs to be in the mitochondria. Oh, this needs to be in the ER. This needs to be a secreted protein. So the ubiquitin is, uh, you know, it's like a coat that the proteins wear. And then that coat tells the cell what is going to happen to that protein, okay? So then if you mess up with this ubiquitination system, the cell does not know, okay, am I gonna clear this protein? Where am I gonna take this protein? Is this, and it's, there's so much confusion. It also sets the stage for the uh, protein aggregation and uh, you know, protein dysfunction and so forth. And it's, it's a very important um, problem in the cell. And UCHL1 seems to be a, a key player um, in, in, in that uh, biology. So we realized that when you take out UCHL1 function in the whole body, okay, so this is like a UCHL1 null system that every cell in the body lacks UCHL1 function. So in that, in that model, you know what happens? It's basically the upper motor neurons that suffer the most. Not all neurons suffer, it's the upper motor neurons suffer. And the mouse actually shows like an ALS phenotype, look at this. They have very bad rotor rot, digigate, grip strength. So they, they have like a motor dysfunction, right? And then if we look in the cortex, they, uh, they, they actually have uh, layer five neurons as seen here with CTIP2, CREMU and other markers that they, they don't lack all neurons like mu N, missile is fine, but this corticospinal specific markers show that there is actually very selective upper motor neuron loss. And we have shown this quantitatively with retrograde labeling and so forth. And again, look at the apical dendrites. Oof, they are filled with vacuoles. They are degrading and they, they have you know, increased ER stress. Uh, in the absence of UCHL1, the upper motor neurons are very, very diseased. And they begin to, like the mouse begins to show phenotype you know, very, very early. So one may think again, you know, oh, these upper motor neurons are de degenerating because the corticospinal tract degenerates, right? Because it's like one way. But when we look at the spinal cord and the corticospinal tract axons, they're fine. So it's not that the axons degenerate and then the cell dies, the cell is dying. <laughs> and because the cell is dying, uh, it can't really maintain its apical dendrites. And I think eventually it will have axonal degeneration as well. So there's very early upper motor neuron degeneration in the absence of UCHL1. So this UCHL1 is very important for upper motor neurons. And it is so important that when we use UCHL1 promoter to drive EGFP expression, we generate a reporter line in which upper motor neurons or corticospinal motor neurons are GFP. And we published this, and now we use this mouse model to um, make many different uh, disease models in which upper motor neurons are GFP. I'm not going to discuss this paper. So then we said, okay, 
UCHL1 is important, all right. How if we give them UCHL1? Even though this is an SOD1 mouse, right? And then we use SOD1 mouse because we have shown in the past that in this SOD1 mouse, the upper motor neurons display early vulnerability and progressive degeneration. So that's good. So then, all right, when you give UCHL1 to the SOD1 mice, oh my God, the apical dendrites, remember we were looking at the vacuoles and diseased ones have very, very high levels of uh, apical dendrite with vacuoles. You give them UCHL1, they don't have that many vacuoles anymore. That's great. And even though SOD1 and UCHL1 are different paths, right? But it, the, it was, um, so for example, look all the vacuoles here and now it becomes healthier. So that was very good news. Then we said, how about in the, uh, how about in the, uh, in the case of TDP mice? I told you, right, there's many different ways um, the disease develops in ALS. And SOD and TDP are actually very um, strange, I would say, because in the patients with SOD1 mutation, you don't really see TDP pathology. So they don't seem to be overlapping so much. And TDP pathology uh, is uh, observed in, in a vast majority of ALS patients, especially ALS FDLD patients, so TDP protein is, is very important and the pathology is very important. So we had uh, the, um, TDP, uh, the, the mass model for TDP pathology uh, with A315T mutation. And we have shown here in this paper that this mouse model, especially the upper motor neurons show very early vulnerability and they mimic the, the uh, pathology at a cellular level mimics exactly the upper motor neurons in patients with TDP pathology. So at a cellular level, there was almost a very um, high level uh, translation. So we said, okay, let's, let's try TDP. And again, many we use many different mouse. And here again, in the TDP, a high percentage of apical dendrites filled with vacuoles and you give you CHL1, it was improved. And again, you know, they degenerate, they degrade filled with vacuoles. Now you can, revert them back to a healthier state, which is very important, we think. Then, of course, we looked at the protein reduction. If there's any reduction in protein aggregation, we were able to show some reduction in overall, all uh, SOD1, uh, and also a reduction in the TDP. So that was very important because now uh, we think that the cortex and the upper motor neurons are indeed targets for treatment. And the viral transduction gene therapies are important and uh, it is feasible and possible. And we think that improving the motor neuron circuitry uh, is important to improve um, the, uh, you know, the behavioral outcome of patients. Because just focusing our attention to the spinal motor neurons or just focusing our attention to the upper motor neurons will not be sufficient. If we want to develop effective treatment strategies, we need to tackle both the cortex and the spinal cord. And I think uh, to improve the motor neuron circuitry, we must improve the health of diseased upper motor neurons as well. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I am ready to take your questions. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Ozden there. Uh, I think I'll kick us off here uh, with a couple of questions. And if anybody else uh, had questions throughout the talk, uh, feel free to post them either in the Q&A or the chat. And we'll, uh, I'll be watching that so that uh, we can slot them in as they come in. Um, but uh, I've got a slew of questions to, to get us started here. So um, first of all, it sounded like, uh, just to summarize a few of the key points uh, that maybe take home messages or takeaways uh, for the community here. Um, it sounded like uh, most of the work previous to the past, say, five, 10 years uh, has been focused on improving the, the health of the neurons in the spine and not the, uh, the brain. Um, but now we're finding that uh, neurons in the brain may be affected potentially earlier than the spine and that uh, decline in health uh, of the neurons in the brain um, potentially could impact the spine, but 
we have to think of them as two separate independent things that maybe it's more productive to think of them that way uh, such that we need to address each of them independently with therapies. Is that a correct um, kind of overview summary of? I, th I think so. So I don't think we should think about uh, consequential, right? Or this happens because this happens. I think it's more complex than we originally thought. And I don't think we have the luxury to uh, leave one component out. And especially the brain component is more important than we think or than we uh, originally or previously thought. And uh, now we have the tools and reagents and the technology to incorporate brain into our thinking. Like in the past, for example, you know, we did not have molecular markers. We didn't have the mouse models or other models. Like we, we didn't have the tools uh, to, to study or to investigate them. But now, for example, we, our lab generated the reporter line uh, for upper motor neurons where we can see them. And once you can see them, you actually, we actually, for example, uh, fax purify them um, with, we purify them by fluorescence activated cell sorting. Then we perform RNA seq, pro proteo proteomics, lipidomics, and metabolomics to reveal what is the underlying cause of their degeneration along the disease progression. So we also know at a molecular level that the vulnerability uh, starts very, very early. So the, yes, the brain component uh, shows degeneration or shows vulnerability much earlier. And we don't think it is a consequence of spinal motor neuron degeneration. Spinal motor neurons may have their own problems, right? I don't think the spinal motor neurons die because sp corticospinal motor neurons die. I think they have their own problems as well. But uh, I don't think it is correct to think one was okay and just because the other one was sick and now the other one became sick. I think uh, this motor neuron circuitry degeneration is more complex than we think. Gotcha. And the other kind of main uh, thing that we got to later in the talk was the, the notion of, of um, addressing it with potentially gene therapies uh, and potentially even... Uh, administering those gene therapies directly uh, to the brain rather than, you know, in the spinal cord or something uh, to that effect. Um, so uh, I see we have a couple of questions here and um, a raised hand and we'll, we'll uh, get to it in uh, just a second. But the one question I wanted to, to ask to kick us off here is that, um, you know, there's, there's over 25 different therapies that are being tested right now. Um, you said that up to now they haven't been tested on as to whether or not they have an impact on uh, the brain uh, neurons, uh, whether they affect the, the health of those neurons. Um, before getting to the, the uh, questions that we have here, is that research ongoing now, now that we know a little bit more? I mean, are uh, the sponsors looking into that and um, you know, determining what so. we might be able to combine? I hope so. So uh, we are actually working with a couple drug companies. And so they say they have preclinical essays and they have their candidate uh, compounds, right? And they want to go into clinical trials. And of course, starting a clinical trial is a very expensive uh, endeavor, right? You need millions and millions of dollars. So you really need to make a very um, educated guess. You want to increase your success rate. I mean, wouldn't you like to know if the compound that you have also improves the health of the upper motor neurons? I mean, if I was a drug company and if I had 10 compounds and I don't know which one is really the one that I should push forward, I would like to know uh, which one also improves the health of the upper motor neuron, right? And that criteria must be included in uh, drug discovery studies, I think. So once, once we know that this compound improves the health of diseased spinal motor neurons, and also the corticospinal motor neurons, I, I think it will have a higher chance of succeeding in clinical trials. So that's what we are trying to uh, achieve in our lab. And that's what we are um, helping other uh, drug companies to make the educated guesses, right? And um, we received a DOD grant building high throughput drug discovery using diseased upper motor neuron survival as a readout. So hopefully uh, we will have better um, selection criteria and more in a high throughput manner so that we can actually uh, give uh, better assessments. So the thing is, there are numerous uh, mouse models 
uh, in which uh, upper motor neurons degenerate due to a different underlying cause. For example, that could be due to uh, lipid problems, due to axon transport problems, due to mitochondrial dysfunction, due to ER stress, due to uh, many other things, right? So then a compound actually may work better for upper motor neurons that are diseased due to, let's say, axonal transport, but not so much the mitochondria. So we can even make uh, help them decide uh, the inclusion criteria uh, for their clinical trials. We can even tell, you know, this compound would work for patients who develop the disease due to this cause. Do you see what I mean? And that's going, that is going to increase the uh, chances of success in, in clinical trials, especially in phase three. So those are the things that we're doing now. And I think uh, in the future, uh, there will be uh, more emphasis on the upper motor neurons. And I think FDA will also start asking them, you know, how about the upper motor neuron, right? Do you have any data on the upper motor neuron? And when they say, oh, I don't know, you know, we never tested, that's a red flag, you know? They, and I think they would give um, uh, importance to the uh, companies who actually tested their compounds on upper motor neurons. And you mentioned uh, some of the mouse models that uh, you've developed. Um, we have a question here in the chat from uh, Paul Miller, he said, um, oh, sorry, from Valerie, uh, have you looked specifically at mice uh, or patients expressing uh, C9 open reading frame 72 repeat expansions? We unfortunately have not because we don't have a good uh, model system for it. And, um, but that, that is on our to-do list. Yes, that's what we would like to do. Awesome. And we have another question here in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, from Henry, uh, does age of the patient, uh, is it a factor when using gene therapy as a, as a treatment? I would, say no, I would say not. Uh, I don't think, you know, age is a factor. It may be um, the disease state a factor, but as long as um, the upper motor neuron cell bodies or upper motor neurons are still there, as long as they can be transduced, as long as they respond to uh, virals, virus treatments, and as long as we can change their gene expression and that results to their improvement of health, I don't think it matters how old the patient is. Um, I don't think the age matters at that time. Okay, we have uh, a question from somebody who raised their hand. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click uh, allow to talk. You should be prompted to, uh, to unmute yourself and you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, and if you... Uh, if that was a mistake or um, if you're having trouble, uh, we'll just move on to the, the next question. So I'm going to go ahead and prompt you now. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. No, I said hello. Oh. <laughs> I didn't see you. You're behind the chat box. Uh, it looks like I'll click ask to unmute again. Let's see. See, these are exciting times for ALS research. And I, and I see that the foundations are getting together, centers are getting together. There are platform trials, international centers, and there are so many uh, compounds uh, on clinical trial. I really would like to see that uh, we succeed uh, and increase our uh, success rate in clinical trials. And I think that would be possible if we also include, include the uh, cortical component in our thinking and in the equation. So, um, we are trying to work with as many uh, scientists as possible, and and I think if we keep the cortex, um, you know, uh, in our thoughts or in, in our experiments, uh, the future will be much brighter for ALS patients. Completely agree, and uh, it looks like we have one final uh, question. Uh, oh, Charles, I saw that you raised your hand, so I'll, I'll uh, give you a chance um, as well. Um, so have you measured the behavioral outcomes of UCHL1 uh, AAV injection in different ALS mouse models? Okay, so we are doing those experiments now because the initial experiment that we have done was retrograde transduction because we wanted to see the uh, at a cellular level how they respond. 
So now we must transduce a huge number of uh, cortical neurons to be able to see if that translates to motor function improvement, if that uh, you know, translates to, let's say, spinal motor neuron improvement, neuromuscular junction improvement, and so forth. So as you can imagine, those experiments take time. And we had our R01 submission. You know, hopefully, they will uh, allow us to do those studies. And um, you can uh, study, let's say, the cortical improvement. There are many ways, but one of the best ways, I think, is the uh, cortical connectivity with electrophysiology. So recently, we acquired a three-brain uh, system where you can look at the cortical connectivity uh, of individual cells and also uh, select regions in the brain and um, investigate whether um, virus treatment or drug treatment improves their connectivity. So those experiments are also ongoing, and I think they would be very much telling. And uh, the other thing I want to tell is the cortical component of ALS requires um, a very fine uh, you know, clinical investigation and also behavioral outcome studies. And doc Dr. Morimoto in, uh, at Columbia University, they developed like a um, similar to ALS FRS score a scoring system for the upper motor neurons. And uh, Dr. Atassi at MGH also developed the study to show, let's say, the uh, osteogliosis or microgliosis basically in the motor cortex. So there are a couple ways to look at the um, cortical dysfunction in a quantitative way. And in a clinical way, I think there are a couple um, behavioral tests that uh, doctors perform and uh, this informs the timing and extent of upper motor neuron loss. So there is some outcome measure for the cortical involvement. And I think uh, those should be utilized for clinical trials as well. And speaking of uh, clinical trials, you know, I think in one, one thing that I'm certainly taking away from this is that the opportunities for improved clinical trials in the future are uh, are big here, uh, considering there's an entire area that we were neglecting up to now, uh, and just getting more information on that uh, will help us identify those therapies that are uh, much more effective uh, in one region or another, and what can be combined. Um, I, I should, uh, you know, we're, we've got just a couple minutes left here, and I did uh, promise to, to mention a little bit more about the um, our clinical trial concierge program, um, and I'll just kind of make a, a brief... Uh, Summary of it, yeah, sure. Brief summary of it. Um, looks like uh, Lucy posted the the details in the in the chat there. Um, but for anybody who's interested in accessing clinical trials right now, so we talked a lot about the the exciting future trials that will likely be coming. Um, but right now, there's plenty of of clinical trials that are uh, accessible. Um, now we know it's very challenging to get access to a clinical trial, especially if you're not at one of the the major clinical trial sites and talking to your neuro neurologist constantly about uh, clinical trial options and opportunities. Um, but for those who are interested in exploring clinical trials as an option, uh, but you don't know what trials you're eligible for or what trials are in your area or you're hitting challenges, getting a hold of the right people at the right clinic uh, or even getting a response, uh, we've heard it all. Uh, and just get in touch with us. The information is in the, is in the chat. You can find information on uh, our website as well. Um, and the simplest description is that it's a phone number that you can call to get help accessing trials, whether that's identifying trials, uh, understanding what information you need to prepare, getting in touch with the right people at the right clinics, uh, and taking care of any administrative steps uh, at the clinic that you need to get through in order to get established at that clinic and, and participate. So the point is there is help available. Uh, you can contact us and, and we will uh, work as, as hard as we can to, to help you uh, get to where you're trying to go. So with that, um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Isenler. Uh, this was a fantastic talk. Um, there were some lingering questions towards the end and we'll, we'll try to get some information out via email uh, after, this, uh, after we close out here. Um, this event was recorded and we're going to provide the, the link to the recording afterwards if anybody wants to go uh, and review anything. Um, so with that, Dr. Risen there, thank you so much for your presentation. Thanks everyone for attending and spending time uh, learning about this uh, really, really important topic. Um, there's 
always things that we can do uh, if we work together. And I'm, I'm really excited to be uh, in this with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation and for this great program. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.